Twitter. Um, it is my greatest pleasure to introduce our friend Bettina and Raymond. I've known them for more than 12 years now. First, I first met him when I was on the way to the office and we were working on the ABC guidelines. And I think a lot of you know him to be the ABC guru who <coughs> all this popular water and nature based solutions in Singapore and also in parts of the world. In Australia, he's also a low fellow at the GSC. Um, all that information um, can be found on their website. But what I want to point out is something that cannot be found on their website, which is that from all this time that I know her, he's been somebody who's really interested in the community. And whatever he does, he always involves. Um, even when we're working on Bishan, he would make sure that you know all the stakeholders come to the table together, talk together, and we figure out an in between solution that is satisfactory for everybody involved. Um, which is why I'm really, really happy to see the setup for him today. And Bettina herself has been working in, um, in the region of Austria, Germany, and she's been looking at rivers in that region, uh, and, and coming up with, a, again, working with the communities, working with stakeholders, with governments. So as a team, um, I, would, I would say the kind of punch. Um, so without further ado, let me welcome her. Uh, I would say, uh, at the beginning, I would uh, actually even start with some water experiments, if I get McKinnon and, and uh, Ray to help me on that. Um, it's, a, it's an honor, it's a great pleasure that we are doing this uh, afternoon uh, with you. And we were thinking uh, a little bit of the typical mindset how we do things. We don't want to sit only top down on people computers and not be passive and uh, just completely put it up here. Um, I'm also an artist and we try very much in our groups really have sort of deeper experience on something. I will talk because I will talk a lot about water and resiliency uh, solutions, water solutions. Yeah. Uh, but actually the best feature for me is always really to look on water phenomena and just understand how water is moving, what is happening and so on. And so we would like to sort of start maybe with two um, Two little experiments. Um, one is, I hope it works. <laughs> we have no time to test it out. But uh, what we will do here is um, we have just a glass plate here, basically, nothing else. There's, there's no trick behind it, right? It's just completely flat uh, thing. Uh, and I just let water run down. And the Tina will uh, help right, to put a little bit more in if we have not enough water. And we will just see what happens when water goes down here, right? Um, of course, water follows gravity. So usually it takes straight, shortest way. But then we can see what happens to the water uh, when it runs down, uh, uh, down uh, just this way. I will just open it here a little bit, and then we can see what will happen. Okay. Can you see, yeah, you can get maybe a little bit closer. Yeah, if you're interested, yeah, if you're interested actually also come here. But, it's, uh, but you can, see you can it actually down. see already that um, it's going downhill, but it makes all kinds of oxbows, all kinds of curves. And what you can actually see very clear here is that even the beginning of that water, I let it now run down a little bit more. You can see how the water actually is shaping forms. This always goes out here, this goes out here, this one goes here, now see what is happening. It's a permanent change of, of process. You can see how this is actually going on, how this starts again, another. It always creates kind of curves, meander forms. Uh, forms you will find all, all around. The um, and I will put some color also into this. Now it goes a little bit off, but I think we have, uh, it's only water, so no <laughs> problem. Um, and well, now you can see it's it. Of, of course, it's um, uh, from, the, from the water side. Um, we could also let it maybe uh, be a little bit more stable or even a bit less water. So a little bit more stable. Yeah, that's good. Okay. And you, then you can see how actually the forms are now shaping even more. And when the curve is too strong, then of course it cuts through. But it's very, very interesting. So um, maybe we could 
uh, just look a little bit what is happening on some some areas. Can you see that, for example, here? The water is standing still here, while the, uh, the oxbow is um, the curve. The outer curve is speed. It's a lot of speed. The inner curve is slow. And this is actually what we see here. What we see down here is the process of resiliency, of change process, what we have in nature with water all the time. When we look at flow and uh, river systems, they are actually in a permanent process of change. Something we actually have difficulties to accept with our cities. We always try to make everything straight, narrow, and keep it every, all the time there. So flexibility in our cities is, at least for water, not something we actually have adapted already. Uh, but learning from water, we can see change process, also that suddenly a lot of water comes, or very little water is going. So the things always is kind of uh, reacting to, to these frame conditions. How much water? Slope, if I change the slope a little bit, then we, you will see it will actually get more already different. I think that's very nice. That's a bit stable here. So I just put some. In an ideal way, if I would do that, you would see that the, um, the inner curve is even sometimes going upstream. That is what a lot of aquatic life, like fishes or different species, are using the different speed zones in rivers. And it's very a good, we know this also from kayaking, that coming up a stream, you always have basically to go in the inner side where the water is, uh, the, the speed of water is much slower and then you jump over to this side and then you go up here. So, um, very, very nice. Okay. So you like to sit here, you see how long the water is standing. You can also see how inside there is a twist. Sometimes, sometimes it turns around like this, sometimes it turns around like this. It's like a secondary movement uh, in, in the water flow. Isn't that interesting and, uh, and, and quite fascinating that even such a very simple experiment, just a slope, just a plate, then like water go down, is showing already all types of phenomena. Maybe let it uh, one more time and take a little bit flatter. Yeah, it's <laughs> like so, yeah, it just like, oh, take this one, take this one all. Oh. Let's see. Maybe it's uh, it's very slow. James is slow. Yeah, okay. <laughs> when we do experiments, we all always like to risk yes. <laughs> uh, something which is not normally simple. <laughs> safe, but uh, without some risks, innovation is not possible. Look at this uh, kind of inner structures of the river. But also down here, all it's going back. So, so actually, water systems and, and river systems. This is a very nice part. They are full of complexity, full of change process, full of uh, different ways of transformation, building up, destroying, building up, destroying. Which is a very basic principle in uh, in nature. And we need also these forces to weep something out, to restart, to bring new forms of evolution, new types of plants, new types of animals. So this kind of change process, which uh, is always needed uh, in nature, in life, something we still have to learn in our cities. How can we actually make our cities more adaptable to change process? And I think um, 
just to look at, at this water phenomenon, you can actually see uh, a lot of what is going on. Look at this here. Now it's very nice to see that stream. Yeah. I think with this very first experiment, yeah, how nice that we were here. It's slower. Good night, sir. I think we do. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. So I think that's that's already um, you have seen a lot, right? Um, and let's go to a little other experiment. Uh, very small uh, experiment here. Um, actually, here this is also. I mean, this is no rocket science. It's all uh, there's a lot of research uh, done on that. Uh, where, uh, people who discovered this kind of phenomena of vortex, uh, is, uh, for example, in a German called the Hermann J. Dodeschmann in Hermann's Hermann's vortex stream. That's right. And what I do is here. I have basically uh, um, uh, this is water. I did put some glycerin in because it's uh, it's actually the viscosity is a little bit kind of um, the speed of water is reduced. Yeah, you have points that send a little bit out so that you can use the camera. And um, I just uh, actually this 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 little experiment would always happen. I just go with a brush through here. Uh, I put it in here in this liquid, and I. Go through that one. And you would maybe say, so what? Nothing to see, right? <laughs> and that's also a very typical thing of water. It doesn't show up all the time in secrets. You know, we have really to kind of be very sensitive and find ways how to make it visible. But if I put a powder on top, you will see what happens. Because now no one has seen it, right? But if I just put a little bit of powder on that, you see this is a very sensitive powder. It's called uh, Lycopodium powder, which is basically from a little moss, from a little plant. Um, and uh, this, this powder I only use because um, on, it stays on the surface. If I would use uh, sugar or something else, it would already suck in. So it's just standing on the, on the surface. And then what I do, I do the same thing like before, I just go with a straight line through that. <laughs> now, this is actually what happened before as well. This is fascinating. And of course it has, you can, ex you can explain it also from uh, flow dynamics. Uh, there is a certain mathematical form behind that, uh, that this comes up. I just want to look at the phenomena of design. So what we see here is a very sort of organized rhythmical structure of vortex, of a vortex street. When you look in into some of the details, maybe we could have, uh, let's, let's zoom in a little bit on that, you can almost find shapes which are very similar to primitive early life, uh, life forms, like jellyfish forms or or even uh, in a very early state, uh, state of an uh, embryo, you find very similar forms and shapes. So I just take it out and I put another little experiment on this. Everyone can do it, it's very really simple. So you just need a, a something dark, uh, a basin. Uh, you put this little podium powder on, on top, mix uh, your liquid with some glycerine. If I would have only water, it would also work. But it would just uh, continue, and then you would not see it. Uh, what I do now is actually I make, it, I make two lines. Sometimes it's always air condition. That's good. And we just go uh, through this uh, in the middle, and you see just how these two spaces act. So what normally we would think is uh, if we have a like this brush, and I put it in, and I go straight through this one, I could even take a uh, kind of a wooden stick and go along this wooden stick. So it's perfect. It would also happen all the time. So what 
you would normally think you divide this water and it comes together and we say, but the way how these two sides come together and actually what happens in front and on behind of this little uh, of, of this little brush which I put through, there is already the beginning of a left and right sided uh, turbulence which creates this vortex which is then creating bigger and bigger forms and structures. Let's just go through this one more time. It's uh, pretty clear. It's a bit bigger. Wow! Look at this. <laughs> it's not always like it, like this. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a different shape. It's always different. Always different. But you find these kind of shapes and forms um, actually not only in water. You find it also in the air, and you find it everywhere. But we cannot see it. For example, if I do with my finger, I make this here. You can be sure, I mean, this what is stream in here. Or if you walk, you have, you create a water street behind your body. Yeah? So, or if there's wind and you have something sticking out like a tree or like a, like a mass, behind that you have a water street. So the world is full of such forms and such phenomena. Uh, and it's, it's quite fascinating. It needs to come up with its forms the right speed the right time, if it's too fast, it falls apart, if it's too slow, it cannot develop. It's also some, something which I find very fascinating on water, what we can learn and see that process needs always a kind of rhythm, needs the kind of time uh, and space, and it has to be the right balance of that, um, which I will come back later on, so I just take it away. Anyone of you wants to uh, to do it, do, do this test, because otherwise you would say, oh, it's only doing it. You have a volunteer, right? Okay. Some volunteer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, how many minutes? Yeah, you can just do this here, like, uh, well, one powder. How many? Yeah, you have just one line. Yeah. One, you can one line. You get just yeah, just a bit. Okay. Yeah. And hold it a bit higher again. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Okay. Then you can just take the key box to the side, the small one, the big one. And see a really, really very tiny, tiny one. one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We just go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can go really dive deep in and dive through and go. Yeah. Wow. Nice. Very nice. Okay, great. So I think we could go on and do much more experiments. Maybe I'll leave it here for this moment. You can want to later actually test it out. Uh, and I think it's always a kind of a mind opener about uh, really what is happening. We say it as just as an example of an exercise that we can see in processes of water, of life, that there's a kind of um, enormous response. Because when we bring movement into that, uh, the water is responding to your speed, to your movement, and it actually is trying to balance out the speed, the space, and you can see that this space is sucked in, this space is sucked in. There's a kind of language between, you know, this side and this side, where we divided it and it comes together and it creates a very, very interesting interaction. Yeah. Or maybe I just uh, take that one out. And then we will start this. Maybe we need this also one So if someone wants to do the experimentation. Yeah. We can yeah. play around and do other words. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Good. All right. Then I think we can start with some. Oh. Um,
Today, um, from all these projects, what you can see different different time zones. You have art projects. You have bigger things like Vision of Mokyo Park or Tennis Springs Park. I never did this alone. I mean, this was always with a fantastic team, and I have to say, some of them are here. And if he was uh, also one of these, <laughs> I'm so proud that uh, you are now in the production that you work with um, uh, the future uh, team so I lost a very, very wonderful My entire team, which was called Artie and I was then transformed to another group uh, because I wanted to bring engineering and design work close together. It's called the Ramble. It's called, uh, here in Singapore, it was called Ramble Suit and Dry Sile. Uh, and Artie and Dry Sile was here before. Now it's called Henny Bars. So just that you know, I'm not a member of this because I let the next generation really continue. Uh, I focus more on consulting work with Bettina, with the brain, uh, and I will also show you this a little bit, so more on the strategic level, how can we actually bring uh, this whole movement. But there are a lot of people still working in this field and, and continue, and some of, the, some of the older projects are there. I'll have to go just maybe this, uh, the click, I don't know, <laughs> it goes a bit fast. Forward. I cannot go backwards, right? Um, uh, is this one here? Can I do backwards? Oh, okay. Only this one. All right. So I was, yeah, okay. But I, you have seen also in between very quickly some slides on artwork, art installations also all around the uh, planet and different scales. So what we have seen with this experiments is something which um, Really, it's interesting if we look at water structures in different scales, small scale, large scale, you find this kind of fluctuate, this kind of uh, permanent transition of form and of space and of process in, in water. And, and that is really very, very fascinating in a way. Uh, I'm really uh, I'm a little bit lost with this. Just trying to continue. 
Yeah. Which, which one is it? <laughs> 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 Good. All right. So, uh, okay, so let's, let's try. Yeah. Um, maybe I, I talk a little bit about this, what we just have seen in very small experiments. You can also see in very large scale. So landscape forms and landscape uh, transition is actually shaped by that. And that's actually the, uh, all the forms you see, also the, the leftovers of some structures which were there before. The same thing what we have, what we have in a small experiment we can see here on large scale. Well, what is interesting is also the, uh, the way how water always tries to balance. Uh, where we have no water, for example, in desert regions, we have extreme hot temperatures during the daytime, extreme cold temperatures at nighttime. So water is kind of balancing a lot of things, also balancing forms. And the interaction actually between water and land is most interesting, most dramatic, which I think is very important. For this one, um, when we look at, at native landscapes, there is still this kind of ongoing form and ongoing transition, what you can see here. By the way, the experiment we just did here, you can also see it on very big scale. This is, for example, um, a volcano reaching out of, in the ocean. And this is about three to 400 kilometers long, also water extreme, like the same what we have seen. So, this kind of things you find in many, many different scales. And what, of course, I like very much is also to do drawings, sketching, and to really work with water in a more creative way and also to come with, up with engineering solutions. For me, it's always a starting point to look more careful at water. And for me, people like Leonardo uh, were very, very um, really heroes because they, they, they somehow connected science, uh, engineering, architecture, philosophy, uh, and they really studied water very, very intense. Very interesting books, what Leonardo did actually write. What have we done today and how did we change landforms and water systems? I just also like to point out some examples here very quickly. What we did all around the world, this is just an example of North America. This kind of, uh, maybe we can call it a bit romantic, uh, forms are more and more transformed or over, there's an over layer by the way how we economically try to make things more efficient. So uh, the Jefferson grid in North America was basically to give equal sizes to each immigrant so that they can start farming and so on. And it was easier, it was uh, faster, it was uh, more compact, so we have made this kind of grid structure. The grid structure was then also implemented for cities, and it was successful in a certain way. But it's certainly not that what actually water structures are doing. We transformed um, the urban landscape, this for example in the rural valley, by getting very, very quick um, A to B uh, straight lines, for traffic and for other things. And actually the future, when we look at cities, and I think here we are, uh, uh, I'm talking to you because you are uh, the future city lab here from EPH and, and NOS, uh, is of course the question, how do density and more and more people who live in cities, how can actually disease be so that they are also somehow in connection with the environment, especially with water? So what kind of forms, what kind of shapes do we need to bring natural processes and human needs of density together? That's a very important question. Um, and of course, every action when we create, uh, when we transform nature, it will come back like a boomerang to us with a lot of challenges. One of the challenges is uh, more urbanization, more intense, uh, intense um, use um, of um, petrol, of gas, and so on, is changing, the atmosphere is changing. We know this all about the, the problems we have on heat island effects. And we have suddenly extreme strong, strong downpours. And for example, in Germany, not long ago, in a country where you think this would never happen, we had similar pictures like in Asia. Yeah. We have this, this brutal uh, flooding in the Arental, you see bridges are destroyed. 
you see that um, uh, land land was taken away. Oh, I'm stuck again here. Look at this. This is Germany. <laughs> You know, a village, and this is actually a crater, and it goes down, and all the water actually is washing out. So there's something where you can see that we are not able to handle really the uh, the change process. This is in my city, actually in Überlingen. This is a train station. At um, 2019, the whole tra train station was flooded, and a very small stream was bringing enormous amount of water. Luckily, you no know, train was there, luckily, you know, no people were there. But you see, we have this extreme conditions more and more coming up. The other part is heat, long periods, no, um, no rain, no water. We had this year already enormous fires where because of dry um, forests um, in Europe, whole islands were burned down, like um, in Greece. And we can see that uh, this global temperature and this change of the water regime, which is basically the whole climate crisis, is very much related to the water question. It's really coming up more and more dramatic. I know it, uh, probably you know a lot of these figures and these data, but what I'd just like to point out, this is in just uh, some data of, uh, of Germany, that uh, 10, 15 years ago, we were thinking the scenario of change and of heat island effects and more and more warmer temperatures um, are going this way. And the worst case scenario was uh, that it really is very dramatic, but we didn't think that today the worst case scenario, what we had 10, 15 years ago as, as estimation, is today the normal. So it, the change process is going faster and much, much quicker than, than we were thinking. Singapore also has, I mean, very, very interesting uh, data on uh, heat island effects. And you see where the city is most dense in this part, this part. We have the red zone where it's very hot, while where we have forests and water uh, here on this region and in the central uh, part of Singapore, the temperature is relatively moderate. So um, this is actually also very interesting to see. Then uh, just to mention this very quickly on uh, in Europe and also all around the world, we have seen that the change process is going much faster. And if we don't react, this, go, this will go up more and more. Um, Bettina and I were actually present at the Globe 21 in Paris. And I know how difficult it is to find an agreement between the governments to come up with somehow action plans, and we failed completely. To be honest, I mean, today we even cannot hold the two degrees Celsius, probably. It will be more dramatic in the future for the next generations. I was also interested to look a little bit, you know, uh, is that new that we are talking about climate questions or climate change? <laughs> what I figured out is really not new because lots of, and I just take only some people out actually already in the fourth century before Christ, they knew that when you uh, take the harvest, when you, when you take the forest out and when, when you dry out uh, marshlands, uh, you will have higher temperatures. Uh, that was discovered already uh, fourth, uh, in the fourth century before Christ. And then of course, a lot of uh, science was done, shown up, very important also this curve, how CO2 emission and uh, global warming is actually connected. Uh, here in America was presented actually to the government. Uh, it was known from a lot of the, the, the companies and actually we are somehow too slow with reacting. And that's a very interesting question. Why is it like this? Here in this presentation, I did just put in some aspects which I think is very, very important. And one of them is of, of course the question of how do we change our cities to be more flexible and more uh, better uh, sustainable for this change process. And I think a very important part is that we think the existing cities have often uh, canal systems, either um, a separated system of sewer and rainwater or combined in some of the older city centers. And still we think that we can handle it, but because of this extreme storm events, we have to come up more and more to this kind of sponge idea that we hold the water in the sea and use it and recycle it, evaporate, have cooling effects, and I will talk more about this in a, in a moment. Well, um, 
I cannot go too deep to, into that, but every opportunity on the very early catchment, when it starts to rain, we have to hold it back. That's what we could do often much better also in Singapore. Uh, for example, HDP housing. A lot of the water is actually drained in concrete canals and just goes away. If we would hold it back, we would uh, do much more clever. Um, there are many ways we were looking actually in lo lots, of, uh, lots of examples how to uh, suck in, how to hold back, how to clean, how to do certain things and how to implement it. And this, this presentation is going very fast. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, it's maybe just if I touch a little bit and it goes already forward. And uh, the question is really how to bring this uh, blue-green uh, water structures in our cities. Well, I would like to share with you, because this is Singapore and, uh, and Switzerland, a bit how actually in different continents this topic was taken up. And a very early one, which I like to show, is actually in Switzerland. In Switzerland, uh, we started early uh, with the um, uh, Generelle Entwässerungsplanung. It was already 1981, 82, 83. I had uh, the opportunity to work uh, in Switzerland for little villages, like this one is uh, called Echelon in the French part of Switzerland, where every water drop is actually kept on the surface, is running on little swales, is getting into a constructed wetlands, where we actually hold the water back, uh, clean it up, and, uh, and use it, and finally re release clean water out into, into the uh, little stream. Um, some other European examples, um, using dry and wet situations, um, having multifunctional use in places is important. And I just like to stay on some Swiss examples. This is done also very, very nice. Not by me, it's another, uh, another architecture group. You probably know this one, uh, very famous the one of the Turbinenplatz in, in uh, Zurich. Uh, all trying to actually bring uh, water features and filters and vegetation as blue green infrastructure into the city. Um, another one I would like to share this before we go then to other continents, large scale solutions were found like for new cities. This is the Nelling Barrack, Nelling Barrack's uh, army base from the Americans, which is now a new housing estate. Um, actually on this project, uh, I just worked with my team to come up with lots of green roofs to hold back, to filter, to slow it down. Then we have also some open spaces like terraces where we can actually bring water in and actually filter it. The other example, Hannover World Ex Exhibition, World Expo 2000. Already here we worked for an entire part of a new city to collect water, to hold it back in. There's no sewer line. Bridge is going under uh, in the underground is actually intact all on site. So uh, the nature-based solutions in the city actually is dealing with the water and uh, is trying to keep it and, and capture it. There's of course a lot of things you have to think about how to uh, work with polluted grounds, then maybe you have to seal some of this, uh, some other parts you can infiltrate. So Kronzberg um, uh, estate is a very interesting uh, example. This is actually just uh, stepping stones where you can cross over. When it starts to rain, then this can actually all be flooded. And we have like a cascade of a treatment drain of holding the water. And this, this principle is, can be done all around the world. It was basically then also later transformed to Singapore as the ABC water guidance. But I'd just like to show you a little bit the, uh, the uh, uh, starting points of that. At the moment, actually, there are also a lot of interesting things going on, especially uh, also in Switzerland and Zurich and here in Basel. Um, Basel is trying to work on new concepts. And we were working actually here for, um, for an area where the heavy industry of, of, uh, of Switzerland was actually taking place, which is actually uh, 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 down here, uh, a, a region called Volta Nord. Walter Nord had all this high Sandos uh, and uh, Bayer and also a lot of other companies who always change the names, but these are the big giants for, for chemistry. Now this is actually becoming a new housing area 
and we have to deal with all these questions about what is in the ground. But we, the city uh, was really interested to come up with kind of new ways of master plans to hold back the water on different sides and we use any opportunity, any uh, small uh, rain gardens or swales to hold it back from rooftops. And we organized basically here in Walter Lord a kind of strategic plan to hold the water completely back. Even on roads, this is actually what we're trying to, to come up with uh, is to have uh, filtration, to have collection swales, and also to have some areas where um, different planners actually are working on different sites. Uh, this is just basically the principle of collecting water and creating kind of a sponge uh, park uh, where you collect the water here on Lüsbichelplatz uh, in, in Basel. And uh, maybe in future this whole thing, oops, go back here, will look like this um, so that uh, we have vegetation, we have evaporation, we have cooling effects, we have trees to, to shelter this place, and there's even in the middle a kind of pavilion which is taking also the water from the ground and is reusing it uh, in a very interesting way. Going back now to some European uh, or German examples here, um, 2000 uh, we did with Renzo Piano the work uh, on Potsdamer Platz, which was a very interesting experience to also harvest water on huge uh, buffer cisterns to recycle, to use the water for plants, for toilet flashing, and that still exists today. It's very, very interesting to see it because that's uh, how it looks like today. There's even a, a highway going um, uh, below the park, below the, the lake. The lake has different um, also water features. And remember, this is only rainwater. It's collected rainwater, nothing else. Right? And the overflow of that is then also going here into a stream called Landwehr Canal. What is interesting is actually that it really is very, very good for the climate, but also it can save energy costs. It, it brings more resiliency into that and, and a lot of these points. Next one, I will just go <coughs> a bit faster. This is actually the industrial zone for McLaren in London, a project with Norman Foster and his team. And what we try to do here is to collect also the water from all the different car parkings here and from the rooftops. And we bring this water into a kind of um, kind of formal lake. Uh, and, and then we have uh, a treatment, uh, which you see up there, where we have uh, filtration and we clean out the water so that we actually can have a kind of system uh, using rainwater and recycling it. The main trick here is, it cannot be done so well in Singapore because we have different humidity, but uh, London has very good opportunities here to work. Oops, uh, it's probably this one before. Um, what we do here with this lake water, we have a circulation and we spread the water out like a cooling tower on a big cascade. So the water is actually dripping down this cascade, and by this, the temperature is going down, right? And then this temperature uh, change, uh, the delta often of two or three degrees uh, cooling uh, uh, by bringing it out, letting it go with this cascade, and, risk, and bringing the water in uh, is enough to cool the entire plant. And uh, that's really fascinating. So added values and things you can actually add on. Um, okay, this is a bit fast, it's okay. Now I would like to go a bit to uh, other countries, uh, America, for example. America had very early on, um, like the um, low uh, impact development program, many cities came up with better solutions, uh, working with water. And what in America was done very early on to find how can we get rid of the pipe solutions and how can we get nature-based solution with more soft engineering into that. One of the pilot projects I was able to do with my team and also with the company called Greenworks uh, is to collect water from uh, the different sites, bring it into a, a park. This is actually the Pearl District in, in Portland, Oregon. Uh, so what we do here, we actually collect the water, we bring it into this park, filter it, we go through different zones of filtration, 
uh, then we finally have a kind of lake system which can also handle and buffer the water we circulate part of that and then finally we get clean water out into the river into the stream now what is here important is that you have to involve the people and lots of the project for me was always important and also for Bettina and for Ray how can we actually involve the local people because it's it's open it's public realm right uh, and that's very very important so stakeholder involvement workshops how the future could look like, what can we use, for example, recycling some of the material, 100 year old steel tracks we recycle and we did reuse it for an art installation here. It's all about creating kind of ownership, identity, and relating people actually to this place. So you can actually have less maintenance costs, less vandalism, people take care, even here we have volunteers who actually take care of this part. This whole question about maintenance and about having ownership to places is extremely important and probably will something that we have to discuss much more in the future. So that's, I think, a, a very big point. I'll just go through, uh, through that one. <clears throat> okay, now it actually goes a little fast again. I just go to look here at uh, Australia. Now, Australia also started early on come up with um, solutions, they call it water-sensitive urban design, that's a frame which was uh, created in, in Australia. I remember this very well, how we started this frame, uh, this, and there's of course lots of people working on this, Tony Wong, for example, and his wife. Now this. China, again, I make this a little shorter, it's now very much also speeding up, coming up with, uh, with better solutions, uh, working on Big, large projects like Tour and Scape or other companies do this uh, quite well with very good examples, um, really harvesting rainwater, treating it on a large scale. And I think that's also a kind of waking up call because lots of problems in China uh, where we have to handle. Now, going to Singapore, uh, see what have we done here? Or what, what is actually going on? Singapore also early on started to come up with um, the ABC uh, guidelines, but even before we had uh, the uh, programs like uh, the water body design panel, uh, then I think it was 2006, uh, seven when we started the ABC one guideline, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was that time. So our team, we made basically the very first principles and it was adapted and taken over. We made brochures, the brochure was actually, uh, I think it's now the fourth or fifth edition already of that, uh, which is basically dealing with this question, how could we uh, bring blue-green more efficient in uh, the city center? And I think if it is where some of the graphics were actually also doing, I remember this very well. Uh, so we looked at different opportunities here in Singapore. One about thinking about uh, controlling uh, the quality and controlling the quantity, because both is needed. Um, how to avoid that you have suddenly a lot of water at one spot and then you have um, Orchard Road flooding, you know, such things or other places. <coughs> so well, how to hold it back? And the other, other way is how can we control the quality so that we have filtration, sedimentation, that we have different uh, principles. This is kind of a toolkit which can be combined with lots of solutions, and they need decentralized uh, forms. So, and then again, we can learn what is happening in nature in a natural uh, forest, like we have also here in Singapore. A lot of the water is actually like a sponge. The, the forest is taking the water, is filtering, is cleaning it. There's a lot of evaporation again. It changes already in agriculture. And when we go to cities, most of the water, what is there, is going into drains. In monsoon drains, is going out as fast as possible. We lose it in the ocean. Very little recharge uh, of groundwater, very little reuse. So that was basically the question how to come up with a better water balance. And, and that is actually what Singapore is now doing quite well. Um, it's always important that you cannot do uh, the solution somewhere here. And you can also not do it just to make the 
canals a bit nicer with some decoration on both sides and still keep the canal. Um, that's often a misunderstanding what ABC actually should be. The real solutions and the real jobs are done very early on in the periphery when you have a catchment uh, area where the water actually goes to the marina bay. We should do much more in the HCB housing areas where the water is landing and actually where the things start where we can clean up, slow down, filter and so on. That's still a discussion, I think. I have tomorrow a discussion with POE. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a learning process which is very, very important. Well, what we have here, we capture the water. I mean, you know this Marina Sands building and, the, um, uh, and also uh, the, the, the entire central part, which is basically now a reservoir. But 10 years ago, uh, or 15 years ago, all this was ocean water. It came all in here. And by building this, this, uh, this dam, now we can collect the rainwater and we can recycle and reuse it. So a lot of these canals have uh, looked like this and are now in process of transforming. And one of the really breakthrough um, pilot projects was this one, Vision Amokyo Park. And I just have to tell you, it looks so easy now, but it was a hell of work. You know, basically convince uh, uh, the different bureaus here um, to convince the different directors who were very skeptical at the beginning. They said, no, 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 we, don't, we cannot do this. We have to keep the concrete. This is the concrete canal, how it was before. And they wanted to keep it and uh, make it maybe a little bit landscape, but still to keep the concrete down there. Uh, <laughs> and then. We were really fighting very hard. We said, we will show it. We will actually convince you by a test reach that you don't need concrete here. You can do it really with very soft engineering, with plants, with material, with different soil structures, with avians, with machine problem, uh, 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 nature-based solution uh, technology, bioengineering. What we did, we recycled the material. We used all the concrete. Because it's very expensive in, in uh, Singapore to get natural gravel, right? We, we don't have it here. So, but we can recycle the material. We can scramble this. We can recycle even the, some of the, the, the concrete and use it. What we had leftovers, we did build a kind of um, um, recycling mill. Uh, when you go there, you see all these kind of concrete glaze are the old canal, right? So people don't know this, and we actually use it. There was also a very nice uh, art installation from an uh, art competition for young artists, and I was uh, we were really happy that we had this competition for Bishla Mokyo Park and have that interesting sculpture. Now I need to drink a little bit of water. <laughs> Well, to make the story short, you can go to Bishma Mokyo Park and see the result. There are lots of details. And just to figure out um, all the different side drains, like how water actually goes down here, you can find everywhere little swales, which normally are done in concrete here. You will see all this open. It's just a natural uh, swale. And when it starts to rain, water is flowing there. And it works perfectly. So you don't need this kind of old, hard, gray engineering. It can be done much better, and by that we have a lot of side effects. What is, I think, also interesting in, uh, in Singapore is that we have much more biodiversity coming back. We have dragonflies, we have species of animals which were on the red list. They are spotted again in the region of Poki Park, because we have also uh, a lot of beavers, of uh, fish otters coming uh, into that, sometimes too many. So we have to control that because they don't have um, predators or what is it called? Uh, they don't work. Okay. Uh, so, so that's actually a lot of just the learning things. Now, another smaller Singaporean uh, project is Cambridge Road. A greening Cambridge Road also as part of the ABC and I think this involvement process in uh, Singapore can be done much more active. Actually, here on Cambridge Road, we were working on a 
kind of um, uh, involvement um, strategic plan. We prepared it, and then COVID-19 came up. So we had no chance to physically meet, and we did it online. We used a special online tool uh, to talk to all the people who were actually involved, young people, old people, all citizens who live in this surrounding. And um, so these are just some pictures of, the, uh, of this online thing. We made sketches, actually they were working on tablets, uh, live and sending over and I could actually, or we, we were able to look in and give, give advice and we used just online tool. So the whole participation project was an online project in the time of COVID-19. We worked pretty well and uh, it's just a very interesting thing. The outcome were little sketches, uh, a lot of ideas of uh, recreating this place and some of that really, you can see it happened. For example here, just go back. Oh, sorry. Here, this is how it looked first. This is how it looks now. This another one here. I think we have to go. This one. This one. This one. This is a video. This is a video. Okay, great. So let me just run for a moment. I think it only works this way. Backwards. This one. This one. Uh, okay. Another one? Yeah. This. Oh, this one? Yeah, this Let's try it. Okay, so this is the video, right? Yeah. This is very, very good. Ray did put the slides very quickly together. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, this is good. This uh, really is showing the change. Uh, before and after. Look, this how, yeah, uh, you could see before the concrete canal, and that's how it is today. Uh, there was also a very nice way of involving also NPARS in that. So NPARS is giving advice, is delivering the plans, but all the maintenance, all the uh, time of putting the plans in was done by the after the uh, participation process. What's the benefit for that? Benefit is really that local people connect to this. They say, uh, we are taking care of our environment. We are taking uh, care also of our water catchment system. And I think that's, uh, we're just in the beginning of this kind of development. And I think we can, we can do a lot. Is there another film? No. Okay. <laughs> just let me know. Yeah. Yes, something. Okay, now I would like to um, actually go uh, a bit in other countries in Asia, and one is actually, yeah, I just mentioned the, the, the thing. Um, Singapore is actually on a very much on a journey uh, to figuring out, you know, how could we uh, bring more the city within nature, uh, and Singapore actually is doing a lot of steps. I don't need to repeat this because you find a lot on that in the internet and there's new parts came up very successful for example Sungai Pulo um, that was also several years back where we designed a kind of observation platform uh, in this part actually we even have crocodiles um, in Sungai Pulo but all this is a bit higher they are bird watching um, uh, cocons for where you can look out and I think this is very, very beautiful done, and I'm very happy. And also at the moment, there is just this year, a new park opened up here, uh, the Ripple Bridge uh, Nature Park in Singapore. Um, I'm very proud, really, because a lot of my old colleagues have done fantastic work uh, creating this kind of new landscape in uh, old industrial sites or in this quarry and creating a kind of very, very beautiful park. Um, Maybe I just go to another oops, on, on another project, um, which is uh, hard to see at the moment, but this is actually uh, on Jurong Island. This one pond, Jurong Island, you know, is an industrial site, and normally you can not go to the island. A lot of uh, kind of uh, secret uh, things which are in development and they, they keep this, you have to have a special performance to go on this island. But what, what happened here with JTC, we were working together on a concept 
to harvest all the rainwater from the buildings, from roads, bring it into a kind of uh, uh, pond or lake system. And what we actually do here is we have different openings. This one of the early sketches in a, in a workshop we did together with JTC. And you see when water comes in, actually it goes into this kind of lake. And when the water is high enough, it will infiltrate in certain areas into the ground, refill the aquifer. It's a completely artificial reclaimed land. And uh, but we store fresh water and we make this fresh water lens in this uh, in this part uh, bigger and it works very well. I'm, I'm happy next week I will uh, make a visit uh, just to see it and how it works. And this is uh, just some some of the pictures I have got. Um, so again, even in the industrial size, we can we can do uh, such such things. Now at the end, I would just like to uh, share some impressions of. Uh, maybe areas uh, where people are not so rich, like in Singapore. Can we actually work in, in areas uh, which are also um, able to come up with solutions uh, where you work more on, on nature-based solutions? This is actually coastal protection. Um, we had two studios here at NOS um, to work on special areas, and I was very impressed how actually in the in, uh, region of Jakarta, uh, they start to use mangroves and they have whole nurseries of, of mangroves. Uh, we had a very nice contact to this, um, to this people who did this. And within actually a very short time, these nurseries for mangroves and this re, re new mangroves had a side effect that a lot of tourism, ecotourism is happening there. It's amazing how many people actually now go there. They have started little restaurants. They have uh, they have places where you can just you know sit and hang out. This is actually a, a picture of my my students. This is one of the the guys who are who are running this program. So there's hope. There's a lot of things going on around Singapore, uh, which I think is very important to recognize, uh, especially here. This kind of coastal protection or new ways of employment. And I would like to share one example here from also a former colleague of, of, of ours. Uh, uh, and this is Anton Siura with his wife. Uh, they have a small company here uh, in Singapore and also in Jakarta. And they uh, actually were focusing on a, on a very interesting project on the, in the park, right in the middle, middle of Jakarta. And actually what is happening here is it is. Uh, it was a, a very sort of kind of rundown part. Not really interesting. I think I have some pictures to share. This uh, how it looked like. I mean, this is actually how Jakarta looks. Often you are probably aware about this uh, traffic, terrible pollution, rivers. You cannot see it. Sometimes water. Chiliung is uh, Chiliung is basically having trash on the surface. Cannot, cannot see even the water and it's sort of floating. Uh, to work in these conditions and to do something out, that's quite amazing. That's on the, in brackets, Singapore looked the same. You know, I'm in Singapore about uh, 40 years, 50 years back, and the same pictures, but I'm taking the same photos actually at that time. Uh, so uh, it's, I think there is always possibilities of hope how to change things. So what Anton and his team did, he used uh, a lot of the techniques, this is the existing one, uh, of bioengineering. He uh, used a recycled material, collected everything we, he had. And then he started to really come up with nature-based solutions. So before and after, um, he created a kind of uh, strategic plan how to work in this entire central part um, to make some, uh, some areas for water but also for people. And this, I think, is very important when it's a lot of rain and this whole thing can build up and then the water can go down. Um, I haven't seen it myself, but I, just from the pictures, it's very convincing. And I think it was very, very um, well received from developers. Real estate development was going up in, in the surrounding. And it was also recognized in Singapore, I think, uh, he got also the uh, President Design Award uh, this year, which is very nice. Um, 
uh, geodetic styles, different techniques of that, how to use it. And this is actually today a very, very beautiful, vibrant uh, park, um, very good design. Well, I end my presentation with uh, also going in an industrial zone, very ugly, and how can you actually create in such a rundown place like Milwaukee in America, how can you actually bring all the features in and make this thing more attractive? This will be my, my last uh, project I would like to share with you. Um, uh, actually, we're working on, on that. It's still work in progress. It's not built. Uh, we came up with an idea how to have here Main Street at the end with a water feature which is working with seasons. So it's called seasonal water. This is actually whoops, this is actually how it looks right now. This is what we might envision. We want to work with light, with sound, and we will work with a structure where you make the whole city really livable and vibrant. And using this water feature at the end, at the moment it's a very boring design, it's very much rundown, and we try to actually make this whole thing more interesting. And the idea was actually to have the four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter, which is in Milwaukee very present, not like in Singapore where you have almost everything all year at the same temperature. Here we have very different temperatures and very dramatic changes. And we are actually working here uh, for such a project. We work with computer technology, but also with real scale models. So this project is done full scale in a big factory hall. And I uh, just share with you this a little bit. Uh, this was actually just um, not even a half a year ago. We started this, uh, this structure. We used uh, clay, nine tons of clay here. We modeled it, actually we did build it up here, and we made water tests. Finally, when everything was working, we used um, 3D data with different techniques. You can even use it with your, with your, mobile, your mobile phone. And then we have a computer program where we get the whole 3D modeling of this and we optimize it. So these are just some of the forms, some of the uh, impressions of the team. Actually, this is Ray, you can see him. <laughs> Here he is. <laughs> when you were, you were extremely happy. And I think the Kenya must also be somewhere. Maybe you took I was in the background. You were in the background. <laughs> okay, and actually, it's uh, probably uh, just for a short moment, maybe take the film. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Okay, I'll let this go. Here we start with uh, clay. This is actually recycled. And now we're like creating this kind of clay. <laughs> it's quite fun. You know, uh, it sounds crazy, but it's great. <laughs> Up. See uh, how it actually like also change has build up out what it how the water is running and we make all kinds of water tests and uh, figure out finally how, how to make it sometimes see that we have to uh, make it higher or make it lower and then we see how we correct it and how to correct it and finally we build it to optimize the form and, and flow dynamic on this and when we have that the right form then we, uh, we use it to take the digital 
data as well. So uh, some, some of the structures just to see. And then, of course, we had uh, family kids. My grandchildren were very, very proud of the test. Uh, and to see what is happening, how is it working, even how it's this flow form, flow form here, the English guy was, and uh, then actually we scanned it in here in uh, that's still a project in progress, so we are hoping that we can build it. Uh, we're still in the process of fundraising. Because in America, a lot of things happen. And every good Neighbors from that's, uh, that's probably the yeah. So we are at the beginning. <laughs> okay. All right. I think I I, I stop here, and um, I would be happy if you have questions. Uh, we have a couple of questions online, um, but I want to open up to the floor first, so that I can hold it up. Uh, not waste everybody's time. Does anybody have any questions? Was like. I have sort of, uh, thank you for the lecture. And I have a question about the temporal centralized water storage systems in the urban context. Do you see if there's any practicality of applying that into like a regional scale for flood control or like water management? Uh, you mean temporary uh, storing the water? Yeah, and maybe like infiltrating amplifiers and then like refill the run water. And, and like a lot of those projects are at a urban scale. Yeah. So I was just wondering like the practicality of that at like a regional scale, like a river scale. Yeah. Um, I mean, well, there, there, there are some interesting aspects. You know, you can actually this kind of uh, uh, using uh, temporary spaces to hold water back and to filter it. You can do this on all kinds of scales. Can do it actually on a small scale, even for buildings, like uh, for some of us here you know, have seen cisterns in the basement, basically holding water back. You can also do it larger, uh, like um, what Singapore is doing with the reservoirs. And I, I think your question is more going entire river systems. And the entire river systems can also have more landscapes which can be periodically flooded. That's something we are trying to do. Uh, in Europe, quite a lot on river systems. It's always very hard to negotiate with farmers to get the land. I think Bettina can tell a lot of that for the river of Danube, for example, where we had big floodings and we started with systems uh, for the entire river, started, for example, in Bavaria and also in Austria. When the water comes up and we have a lot of water, how the how can we do it so that we have landscape parts we call it polder, which can be flooded for a certain time? And then what we saw on the river Rhine uh, also. We have a lot of uh, master plans, strategic plans in Europe for the uh, water uh, framework uh, directive to try out to have really more resilient systems on a large scale. So I think that can also be done. What is always tricky is um, who has ownership, who is giving away land, what allows this. And you know, it's very, very interesting. If you look, uh, nature really has not very much uh, rights or advocates because we have taken the, this, this space away from rivers. 
basically on all around the world, the rivers had much more space uh, to flood, to, to uh, be wider, and then, then when normal times the water is smaller, but it needs this kind of breathing system. And uh, what we did, we just filled it up, used it all, made it more narrow, <laughs> and now to give the water back some space is a huge uh, work to negotiate it, to work it out. And uh, it's, it's very tricky. It's a political question, it's a financial question, it's a ownership question. And I think this debate is uh, still ongoing in many, many countries. But it's very important. Also, Switzerland, too. Okay. I have a question. Oh, go ahead, please. Um, have you ever conducted more and rigorous studies on how microclimate is affected by projects. Um, context that we're for the Cooling Singapore project. So I'm very interested in these. I'm, I'm actually, we are very interested in knowing more about it. Uh, I know there is data available on evaporation and cooling effects from trees, for example. Uh, water features, probably the water feature itself, uh, like the, the surface of water, is probably not doing so much of uh, because you need a big surface of where uh, evaporation can take place, uh, which trees are doing much better. But this combination of you know, having humidity and holding water back, bringing it to clouds so that they can actually uh, freeze out and have this cooling effect, I think that's a very efficient way. Um, I know some studies, um, but uh, actually on a larger scale of how water like the ABC would have a cooling effect in the city. Uh, I'm not aware that there is really a very significant, a significant research done. And I, I think there's a big chance because I think there's for climate resiliency and to stabilize climate, I'm absolutely convinced the water story is very, very important for me. But yes, actually, there is a um, research module here at FCL cool. it's, uh, called Comparative Ecologies of Cities. They're looking exactly at that. Um, how the water is creating microclimates. And looking at that as well as, I think, uh, we have trees essentially in, in parallel. Are they, what's their approach? Are they doing this based modeling or are they doing this no, just, based on projects that are actually being realized? No, they're actually calculating. They're, they're creating calculations based on, okay. um, I know that they're using some sort of computer software, maybe even digital. I'm not sure if it's digital twins. It could be, but part of the college of cities, if you slack me out, sure, these are the right people. So, yeah, the kind of context again for this is we often get questions regarding real world demonstrations of, of our modeling applications to reduce our impact. I think projects like the Uncle Kill Park here, for example, would be great, a, a great kind of first start way to actually compare the two situations before and after construction yeah. to have a solid argument for why these changes are nice. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, on uh, Vision of Oakia Park, um, we, I know on some research, or also what we did with NPARS, is looking about more on uh, two things, uh, biodiversity, uh, what about, um, uh, what about uh, species of uh, insects, birds, there's an enormous increase uh, with this change. And the other part is, of course, the interaction of people. Uh, at the moment, uh, it's very interesting that the number of visitors, which are in Vishnu Mokhi Park, are locals. They are not tourists, like uh, on um, Marina Barrage, uh, you know, like the, the super trees or so. Uh, it's almost the tourists. Vision of Mokhi Park is really really a local park for local people. And they love it. It's amazing. I mean, if you go there, I, I'm very often have a chance to make a little walk when I come there in the morning or in the evening. Uh, it's, it's amazing. So I think all these things could be a very interesting further research. You know, okay. We did some research here with um, NOS uh, about psychological effect on a straight canal or on making, making it more uh, natural uh, about the biophilia effect. 
uh, one research was psychologically how, many, how much people trust others. If you are in a healthy environment, people feel more trustful to others. If it's more in concrete and everything, people are more afraid of others. That's very interesting. I'm going to read out some of the questions. I have three. Uh, I'll go with the easiest one. In your experience, what is the frequency of one event that you be in infrastructure in total? For example, one in five or one in 20, one in 100 years of event. Is there a maximum limit? Do we testing? I think we're big shunt part of the biggest one. So. Yeah, we did. We, we, we had actually both. We had one to. I can't remember exactly. I mean, this is, uh, I think, uh, one to five is very little, but it's often required. Mm -hmm. um, one to 20, one to 25 is, I think, what you should actually count in. And the worst case scenario, one to 100. Mm -hmm. But one to 100 is today different than 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Because the, the extreme flood events are, are actually much higher. Mm -hmm. And in, in my uh, opinion, I think, in, uh, in on Bishan Motor Park, we did one to one. Um, and basically, on lots of projects, the important thing is that you calculate it on, on, you can actually calculate it also on one to 20 or one to 25. And you should then know if a worst case scenario would happen, where would the water go? So, I'm, I'm more a fan about. You know, finding flat, uh, flat um, yeah. cor um, uh, uh, corridors or on yeah, 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 yeah. So that there's like like, an overspill that is right, safe. It's exactly. Safe yeah. That's what we did, for example, in Copenhagen with the cloud cloudburst project. Mm -hmm. So we can even have a road, or in Hamburg, the Visa project, um, where we have roads which can actually have maybe twenty centimeters of water mm -hmm. and bring the water out if there's really an extreme storm. Mm -hmm. Second question. Um, in practice, how do you ensure that installing blue green infrastructure is not just beautification and somehow greenwashing? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> well, that's, that's always, I think, um, I mean, we try to make not greenwash. Mm -hmm. uh, in in, in a, a lot of the projects, um, I think I could prove that it really does uh, really function. The problem is that. Um, this is actually a warning. It's not a criticism, but it's a kind of warning. What uh, we should be careful uh, when we say A, B, C, that we see only the beautifying, and then this can be greenwashed. And that's why I'm often saying that you have to look in the periphery and really act there before it gets into kind of But what we have a little bit as danger is that we reduce the ABC program now only for beautifying the canals, and that's greenwashing. And maybe if I could add to that point of working with you in, in the firm, there is the bread and butter, and then there is the, the big project that gives you the marketing cloud, right? You do this, you shall come over the park, and everybody knows you're there. But then it's doing the supposedly boring projects, like the roadside projects, and do this roadside swales. Well, are not interested, but those are actually the real yeah. projects when you do it multiple times over throughout the entire city. Exactly. That's exactly what holds the flood mitigation possibilities. Um, last, I'm going to open up to the floor before I come back to the last question. Yes, please. Um, I think I'll talk. Um, and most of the projects where you allow for flooding. Could you share some of the challenges that you face when convincing the people staying around and the authorities and how you overcame those? Uh, convincing them for funding or for accepting? Yeah. More for accepting. Yeah. Um, maybe a good example is, um, I'll just pick one, which is very good to explain. Um, probably the, the one you also have seen in America, right? The, uh, because it's in the rural district, yeah. uh, in Portland, Oregon. It was, it's right in the middle, surrounded by lots of uh, schools of, and, and uh, housing, uh, this new housing estate in this area. Um, I think very important is actually that you involve the people into the project. So they have to know why is this design, why does it measure, what's the performance, what's the reason. 
uh, and I think that's very, very important that we actually involve the stakeholders, um, but also the local people who are living there, that they, that they really know what is actually, why are we doing um, these projects to help the environment or also to stabilize our climate and what, what kind of contribution is it? Of course, a single project actually is like a drop on, on a hot stone, but many drops make a change. Yeah. And uh, I think that's very, very, very important. The other aspect is probably that you also have to see um, that you involve um, people who work on real estate developing, uh, financial cap uh, capital, people give capital. If you create a really good uh, blue green infrastructure, the value, the added value is going up. For example, a vision of Moka Park, some of the new uh, big buildings, you know, they can new big buildings in, they use the image of vision of Moka Park even before it was built and did rise the price for, for the condos. Yes. <laughs> Which is not always a good thing yeah. for people, but it shows how much value. Um, in the interest of time, if there is no other question, I'm going to give the last question. Okay. Water system design requires a lot of simulation and calculations and anticipation of future exploitation under climate change. But landscape architects are not usually in the right access to such data. What do you think from your working experience are the important data sets and which skills? We need to be establishing and integrating to develop effective water design. Yeah, it's it's a very long but very important question. Um, I mean, if you know this, uh, we were always trying to combine um, good uh, landscape architecture with very good hydraulic engineering. So uh, these skills have to come together. So you need to make all these projects. They look. Beautiful. They are, by the way, not more expensive than normal projects. It's just the engagement you need for that. But they're all based on data. They're all based on hydraulic uh, engineering. We can calculations. We can use computer models about how uh, how much water we will have. What's the flow rate? What's the viscosity? By having different surfaces, what's the resistance? All that has to be worked out, especially on large projects. We often even do sometimes on very complex things to make numeric flow simulations on computers. So all that I think is data based um, and that should not be taken out. The professional landscape architects, I think, has to probably develop much more forward that because landscape architects in Europe, for example, Switzerland or Germany are more and more taking leadership or for really good projects because it's, everything is in the open space. It's not buildings itself. It's about how to use the, the uh, corridors, reconnectors, open space. That's where actually you can do a lot. And that means that landscape architecture has to go a step forward and do more than just using plants and bringing that here or here or here. You really have to make a very integrated thing Good teams and good companies always include, with landscape architecture, good engineering, traffic systems, um, uh, public involvement, uh, stakeholder involvement. All these things actually have to come together and that makes it so interesting. And the best is, of course, an interdisciplinary uh, team to work uh, with. So hopefully that's... Yes, that was very, very helpful. Should we give Robert um, another round of applause?